have been paying attention to the news coverage of uh, the Nathan Wade and Fannie Willis, and now she's calling herself Fannie. I guess uh, I guess that's what her name is, but for forever, I've understood it as Fanny. Anyway, uh, we'll get past that. But right now, joining me on the program is none other than Ashley Oliver. She's a D, uh, Justice Department reporter for Washington for uh, for the Washington Examiner. So, Ashley, welcome to the Officer Tatum Show. Thank you, Carl, for having me. Happy to be here. All right. Well, see, here's what I do. Here's what I do, Ashley. When I want to read about this story and I want to take it seriously, I make sure that I read your columns because there's something about the name Fanny that makes me want to laugh. But I try to reel it in. So I'm like, Carl, you got to be professional. That's why you read Ashley Oliver of the Washington Examiner. But I got to tell you, Ashley, this case has been like a soap opera. This is completely insane. Can you give us a little history of, of this case before I get into your latest column? Yeah, so it is absolutely TV worthy, the turn that this case has taken in Georgia. Um, you know, the the gist of it is that several co-defendants, including Trump, have argued Fonnie Willis. I'll pronounce it how she wants it to be pronounced, Fonnie, Fanny. Okay. Um, the, she has an irreversible conflict of interest in the case because she has been romantically involved with one of the uh, prosecutors that she hired, Nathan Wade. Um, that's the gist of it. There are some argument like sub arguments there uh did she financially benefit from hiring wade and then going on vacations with him um did does she have an appearance of a conflict of interest was she romantically involved with him when she hired him in november 2021 um a sub argument to that is that fonnie willis and nathan wade have both testified on this matter and said that their relationship began uh, after she hired him. But there has been this evidence that continues to emerge that shows otherwise, which would signal that they lied on the witness stand. Uh, what the judge in the case wants to do about that is uh, maybe separate from whether or not he wants to disqualify her from the case overall, but he still has to weigh uh, all those conflicting testimonies. Okay, and again, I'm speaking with my guest, Ashley Oliver. Uh, she is a Justice Department reporter for the Washington Examiner. The title of her latest column, uh, Trump Co-Defendant Offers New Testimony, or I should say her latest, uh, Fannie Willis. I'm just used to saying Fannie, so I'll say Fannie. Uh, Trump Co-Defendant Offers New Testimony Amid Push for Fannie Willis Disqualification. And this was a bombshell. Uh, this was a bombshell, Ashley. Uh, so here, here's here's the latest um, and I'll let Ashley fill you guys in. But the latest is basically this guy, and, and I'm going to get names mixed up, so I may need your help here, uh, Ashley. But Terrence Bradley, who is the former divorce attorney for Nathan Wade, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, had conversations right. with the DA or an attorney in the DA's office in another county in Georgia, Cobb County, as opposed to Fulton County, where he told this particular lady, I don't know why he was talking to her in this fashion, but he told her that he had uh, known that both uh, Fannie Willis and Nathan uh, Nathan Wade started their relationship as far back as 2019. And it appeared to be open conversations between the two of them. So she was shocked when she saw him on the stand testifying that that wasn't the case or acting ignorant of that. Yeah, so that was one bombshell after several uh, kind of, if you want to call them sort of small bombshells, one after another, um, after the hearing on this matter had occurred. So that particular case, um, what happened was Terrence, just to rewind a little bit, Terrence Bradley is, okay. like you said, Nathan Wade's former divorce lawyer, right? So uh, text messages over the last couple weeks uh, surfaced. Uh, they first broke on the Megyn Kelly show, um, but then lawyers attempted to submit them into evidence after a hearing had occurred on this on, on the disqualification question, basically showing that Terrence Bradley, maybe because of a fallout with Nathan Wade of some sort, basically went into cahoots and coordinated with Ashley Merchant, the lead lawyer uh, on Trump's side, uh, to bring these you know, allegations against Fonnie Willis of an inappropriate relationship. Um, so he was texting back and forth with her in a very ex you know, coordinated manner, saying their relationship began before she hired him, et cetera. Uh, there were hundreds of messages. 
Terrence Bradley took the witness stand. The problem here is he said very shiftily, I was just speculating. I don't really know when their relationship started. That has clearly proven to be false based on these text messages and based on what you just read about a conversation he had with another attorney in a separate jurisdiction. Um, and then there was another filing that I haven't, I didn't write on, but it was similar to that one and had testimony from, or proposed testimony from another witness who talked to Terrence Bradley. So uh, this guy seemingly had a lot of information about the start of their relationship that contradicts what both Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade have testified under oath as saying their relationship started after she hired him. Now, whether this supports the overall disqualification argument is a question that remains open. Um, the judge in the case, Scott McAfee, has said that he will decide quickly, um, you know, it's been tough to criticize McAfee for Republicans. I mean, they found he at one point donated a very small dollar amount to Fannie Willis, but that was kind of standard. It was, um, you know, people who work in that office tend to do a small dollar donation to the uh, district attorney in the in the actual office there. It was a long time ago. Um, it's not unethical. It's not against any ethics rules. So that was the most they could really come up with with him. So other than that, he's been very fair in the case for both parties. He seemed very even keeled. He's, um, you know, d made, mo you know, made decisions in favor of the defense and against the defense somewhat evenly. Um, and so at the end of the last hearing, he said that he expects to make a decision on Fonnie Willis' disqualification in the next two weeks. So uh, what you just read, that story there and these, you know, bombshell text messages and whatnot all have come in after uh, he has kind of already indicated he knows whether or not a conflict of interest that uh, warrants disqualification has occurred. So it it's not really clear if he's going to weigh this or not. I mean, he can, but it's hard. It's hard for anyone to know. Um, even some of the most you know experienced legal experts have had differing views on what McAfee should do. Um, but ultimately. Uh, he hasn't necessarily, re the defense hasn't necessarily reached a threshold for a conflict of interest, but if he considers the appearance of a conflict of interest, then he could ultimately disqualify her. If you're Fonnie Willis right now, you're probably very nervous and we'll know what's going to happen in, you know, days, 10, within probably the next 10 days here now. So um, it is, like you said, a sitcom. And if she's thrown off the case, um, the, it could be a fatal blow to the case because it would have to go to somebody else's office. They would probably have to start from scratch in terms of investigations and prosecutions. This has already gone through a really tedious legal process, you know, investigative and prosecutorial process. So someone would probably have to start that over. Um, and the complexity of it is such that that it, that could be an insurmountable hurdle for any other district attorney's office to take on. Um, and at that point, this is, I mean, it, it just prolongs the case just at an exorbitant amount. I mean, Trump may be in office by the time this uh, actually get, gets off the ground, if it ever does, in the event right, of a that's disqualification. A, that's a very good point. Now, Ashley, listen, I only I have less than two minutes before the break. Can you stick with us another segment? I just want to ask you now before we go there. Do you have time to do that? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. That works. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then let me let me ask you this question. We have just over a minute be, uh, before the break. Uh, it, let's say that uh, this judge, Scott McAfee, decides to disqualify uh, uh, Fannie Willis. It does go to another uh, uh, district attorney. That district attorney, from what I could under, uh, what I understand, just like you said, it would be very hard to uh, with the complex, uh, complexities of this case uh, to go ahead and retry it. But at the same time, they they could. So this this doesn't necessarily mean a win for Trump, even though I thought it should mean a win. One minute. Um, you know, from the lawyers that I've talked to down there, it would be a win for Trump because no one else okay. would want this case because it is Good. impossible to start from scratch. Um, if there is a really eager uh, district attorney out there who wants to take it on in the neighboring jurisdictions, then that could potentially happen. But look how long it took Fonnie Willis to bring this case. It could you know, it, it could take that length of time again. Um, so so most lawyers have said that it would probably just permanently derail the case. All right. Yeah, that uh, that's a that's a very good point. You're right. I mean, just considering the fact that these allegations of Fannie Willis's affair go all the way back to 
what, 2019 and then November 2021, I guess, is when the case was first uh, or they first indicted Trump. So anyway, all right. We'll, we'll be back more with Ashley Oliver. Uh, she's a, uh, a Department of Justice reporter for the Washington Examiner. We're talking about the Fannie Willis case. We'll be back in a few. I'm back with my guest, Ashley Oliver. She is uh, a DOJ reporter, a Justice Department reporter for the Washington Examiner. Uh, she's been covering this Fannie Willis case extensively, uh, so make sure you check out her work. By the way, Ashley, where can people find you uh, online if they want to check out your work and get to know you better? Uh, they can go to WashingtonExaminer.com, of course, and I also usually, I mean, at times I'll tweet my stories. I'm not super active on Twitter, but I'm occasionally active. So um, my Twitter handle is Ash Oliver, and I'll put stories on there from time to time, too. Okay. All right. So now let me let me just, I got to ask you, just just on a, on a personal note, all right, you're, you're a reporter for the DLJ or a Justice Department reporter. Do you ever get a little nervous <laughs> writing stories <laughs> that relate to uh, some of these some of these cases? Is there ever an intimidation factor type thing going on that you feel or it's just like, no, I'm just here to do a job and I'm going to knock out these stories? Um, at this stage, no. You know, I've been doing this since last summer now for The Washington Examiner. And uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of pressure because, you know, you do hear from people, you know, at the Justice Department, you know, wanting to make sure that you're giving them, you know, a fair perspective and a story. Um, and then, of course, you hear pressure from the people that they might be prosecuting or going after who want their fair perspective as well. So there's just that sort of normal amount of pressure uh, in reporting to okay. make sure that you're representing sides as uh, best as you can and keeping all parties, um, you know, pleased with your uh, representation of where they stand on things. Um, so that would probably be the extent of it at this stage. But, um, you know, as my career progresses in, you know, that could it, it could up the ante some at some point, you know, but. OK. OK. All right. So I, just to, that was just me being curious. Let me let me ask you this, because there's something this is something that you wrote about in your column. And again, check out uh, uh, check out her latest column on uh, Fannie Willis. And again, I have to pull this up on my phone because I forget the title. Trump co-defendant offers new testimony amid push for Fannie Willis disqualification. But one of the things that I found that were that were just shocking, Fannie Willis literally called Terrence Bradley while he was sitting in the other uh, DA's office, uh, it, help me out if I'm wrong here, in the DA's office where this this attorney could literally hear Fannie Willis telling Terrence Bradley, Nathan Wade's old divorce attorney, basically just shut up. Don't let anybody know anything. And this attorney was able to hear that. So I don't know if he had her on speaker. I don't know if Fannie Willis was just talking, speaking that loudly, but that's pretty disastrous for uh, uh, for for the uh, DA, is it not? Yeah, it's um, it's great that you noticed that because I feel like that's been a somewhat underreported small detail that was buried into one of these court filings uh, that Trump filed recently, but um, or Trump's attorney rather. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, this this attorney, she is an attorney who works in Cobb County. Um, she serves in a higher level position there, so she has some credibility to her name as far as anyone can tell. Um, and she's saying she literally heard Bonnie Willis talking to Terrence Bradley, telling him not to talk about this case. Um, it was after she read in September of last year, a story about the amount of money that she has been paying to private prosecutors that she's taken into Fulton County to, uh, well, Nathan Way, we know she used to prosecute Trump. Um, others she's used for other legal, um, you know, like a taint team is what Terrence Bradley worked on for her. He was paid a little bit in Fulton County. And then there was another person that worked with connected to Nathan Wade that was also paid in Fulton County at one point. So um, the Washington Examiner actually did, I want to say we did the first story that pointed out these three different people, including Nathan Wade, who she just totally bankrolled and, you know, paid public funds to, to help her in the Fulton County office. Uh, at that time, the relationship had not been, uh, it had not surfaced yet uh, last September, but there were, you know, murmurings about the nature of their relationship at that time. Uh, you know, it was unverified, so not something that was reportable at the time. But of course, Mike Roman, one of the co-defendants in the case, totally broke it open in January when he filed a massive legal document detailing the history of their relationship. Um, but that came after, like I said, a few months of murmurings that clearly had been 
uh, sparked by Terrence Bradley, who was Nathan Wade's divorce lawyer and privy to his sort of personal life goings on. Um, but yeah, Fonnie Willis clearly knows Terrence Bradley and seemingly called him and told him, you know, they're coming after us. Don't say anything. Now, was this, you know, a uh, sort of unethical way of silencing him? Some might perceive it that way. I, I'm not sure what her defense is for that. I believe she filed a, a, a defense of some sort in the last 24 hours. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I'm not sure how you um, how, how she'll defend that behavior. But I don't even know if she responded yeah. to it. Uh, honestly, I, I this is just pure stupidity. I, I mean, this is one of the you're 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 prosecuting one of the highest profile cases in American history. I, I I mean, this is just pure stupidity, in my opinion. Let me let me ask you this: Going back to Fannie Willis taking the stand, the same is, is true with Nathan Wade. Uh, in your opinion, one of the dumbest decisions ever uh, <laughs> that you've witnessed as far as court proceedings are concerned, especially since it was voluntary on her on her part? So everybody watch, you, are you saying is it dumb for her to take the stand? What, was it dumb for her to voluntarily take the stand uh, that uh, the day that she did, uh, you know, a couple of weeks or so ago to try to defend herself? She just dug a hole for herself. It was it was shocking that she took the stand when she did. I was not personally in the courtroom, but as we know in Georgia, these proceedings are live streamed, so everybody could watch them. And so it was on every news channel in America the day that it happened. Um, but you could hear people that were in the courtroom talking about it, pundits or not to pundits, but just political reporters that were actually in the courtroom down in Georgia. Um, they were all saying it was just as shocking uh, from an insider's perspective to watch her waltz into the courtroom unexpectedly and say right then and there, I'd like to testify as a witness. It was out of the blue. She had been subpoenaed to uh, appear as a witness, and she was in the process of attempting to fight that subpoena. So this actually occurred after she had already said, wait, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to testify on this matter. I'm, I'm trying to quash the subpoena in filings. And then she shows up in court and she's somewhat uh, I don't want to say frazzled per se, but clearly has this heightened sense of emotion as she's trying to testify. She loses her cool a couple of times, resulting in the judge lecturing her. Um, so it was just a shocking uh, turn of events that no one really expected that day. Um, and I, I saw some people punditing afterwards saying this is like kind of Bravo material at this point what we're watching. So yeah. <laughs> it's certain. It it certainly was. I, I could not believe it myself. We have less uh, less than a, uh, than than a minute left. Is there something that I left out that you want the audience to know uh, about this case in thirty seconds or less? Um, the Fonnie Willis case. I think you mostly covered it. Just to point out, four defendants have already uh, secured plea deals, and one interesting feature is that if she's disqualified, they may move to um, reverse those plea deals so that they are not they don't have these guilty pleas on their record at this point because the case would have been permanently tainted if the judge does deem it have having been tainted by a conflict of interest. So that's something else to point out. There were 19 co-defendants, but now. Um, it's down to 15 at this point because of those uh, guilty pleas. Yeah, and one of them is uh, one of my colleagues, Jenna Ellis. So from your mouth oh, yeah, to God's ears, Ash yeah, Ashley Oliver of the Washington Examiner, thank you so much. God bless you. You take care. Thank you, Carl. You too.